July 1st, 2016 marks the 95th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. The CPC, the party. How has the CPC, as China's ruling party, led the country in its remarkable development and modernization? How has the CPC adapted to changing conditions, kept up with the times? What can we learn from the CPC's history, its triumphs and tragedies? Why now must the party be rejuvenated? How to standardize decision-making processes and establish credible checks and balances in a system with a single ruling party? Is transparency friend or foe? What challenges does the party face amidst domestic complexities and international volatilities? What does the party consider its greatest threats? And what are its enduring ideals, its big visions? The party's changes and challenges take us closer to China. Number 76 Xingye Road, Huangpu District in Shanghai is a typical Shanghai-style Shukuman architecture. In the middle of this newly renovated two-story building sits a rectangular table, surrounded by a dozen stools. 95 years ago, a meeting was held here that would have profound influence on China. It was the first National Congress of the Communist Party of China, and it marked its founding. Over the past 95 years, the number of CPC members grew from 50 to about 88 million, and it has been the party's ability to adapt to change and to correct mistakes that has enabled its achievement. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, Chinese people continued overthrowing colonialism and feudalism, participated in fighting a war with Japanese invaders, founded the People's Republic of China, carried out land reform, endured extreme ideology and political mass movements, instituted reform and opening up, and established a powerful market-driven economy. Many people argue that the hidden power of the Communist Party is in its ability to keep up with the times. But to fully understand how such achievements were made, one must understand how decisions are made within the party. Professor Xie, it is said that one of the prime characteristics of the CPC is its capacity to adapt to current conditions, to keep up with the times. As an eminent historian of the party, how do you interpret these concepts? Keeping up with the times is highly critical to the CPC. As conditions evolve, the party must adapt in order to achieve prosperity. Otherwise, the only way out is to perish. In this regard, the CPC has experienced both frustration from failure and happiness from success. For example, the CPC has been guided by Marxism and Leninism, which originated in European countries where conditions differ a lot from those in China. In Europe, their Communist Party was made up mainly of workers. In China, we had more farmers than workers comprising our Communist Party. Then, in Russia, the revolution broke out mostly in central cities. In China, we took a completely different path by fostering our strength in villages, particularly in mountainous regions. We occupied cities only after building up our team in rural areas. How does decision-making work in the party, uh, both at uh, grassroots level and then city and provincial level and then uh, central uh, authorities in, in Beijing? What can you describe about the decision-making process uh, in, the, in the CPC? When I once visited a Latin American country, I told the people there that there is only one power center in China, that is, the CPC Central Committee, as it makes almost all the critical decisions in China. The Central Committee has many members, government, MPC and CPPCC leaders, as well as those from important SOEs, the army, and others who participate in major decision makings in China. After a decision is made, party cadres in the government, the MPC, the CPPCC, the SOEs, and the army will then implement it. I think this procedure in China differs from many countries.
Can we understand how the Central Committee does that? Because the Central Committee uh, has almost 200 full-time members and less uh, alternate members, so it's a very big body. Uh, so how does it actually go about um, uh, coordinating that on an individual topic, reform you mentioned or other topics? Uh, how does the Central Committee then empower one of its agencies or one of its departments to take responsibility? I'm trying to understand the the actual work process. In my opinion, there are four steps before the Central Committee issues an official document. First, deciding on the topic. Topics for the plenary meeting of the Central Committee are all set by its political bureau. This is a long process. The topic for discussion and research should be of far-reaching significance. So the central leaders will first think the issue over and do some research and investigation, which includes collecting opinions from relevant parties. The second step is for all relevant parties to study the topic. Let's take Secretary Xi Jinping as a representative of the central leaders who do research and investigation. When President Xi visited certain provinces afterward, he may be doing some work on the topic. Some departments related to the Central Committee also do research and investigation. The Central Committee may divide the topic into specific issues and let relevant parties take charge. The General Office, Party School and the Organization Department of the CPC Central Committee are all relevant parties that would be held accountable to do research and investigation. The third step concerns the actual drafting of the document, which always takes a long time. Drafting is normally supervised by central leaders and in more important cases by the general secretary. In the first stage of drafting, opinions will be collected for an initial version. The draft is constantly revised for improvement. When the version is evaluated to be somewhat mature and well modified, a more extensive survey for suggestions will be held in a larger group. Party committees at the provincial level, government departments, organizations at the Central Committee and the Army will all be consulted for advice. This leads to further revisions to the regulation. The fourth step is the meeting. The plenary meeting of the Central Committee takes four or five days, during which the document is discussed and suggestions for revision welcomed. Some important revisions may take place in the process. After everyone presents his opinion, there will be an official voting for the final approval of the decision. Can you give us some examples that you've personally been working on in the past? I, I don't want any state secrets, of course, uh, but what are the kinds of things that you have done, and I'm more interested in the process. When you got a document or you were asked to do research, what did you do? Uh, how many pages was it? Uh, how long did it take? Just interested in the, in the actual work process. I can offer you a specific case. Last year, I was involved in decision making for the approval and the issue of the CPC discipline regulation. It is a very important document made by the Central Committee to regulate party members by specifying forbidden things and possible punishments. In this case, Secretary Wang Qishan of the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection of the CPC presided over the revision. I myself had been consulted twice during the process. The first occurred at the end of July 2015, when Secretary Wang Qishan personally held a meeting and invited scholars from all relevant fields. Apart from such meetings, he also meets with the leaders from central party departments, people in charge at the local levels, and others to listen to ideas from all sides. After revision and before officially delivering it to the Central Committee, Another round of getting opinions in written form will be carried out across the party. So this gives me another opportunity to view the draft and voice my opinions. So in the meeting that scholars that you participated with uh, Secretary Wang Qishan, about how many scholars were there and was the input verbal, everybody talking for a minute or two, or did you have input in writing? Was there discussion? How long did it last? What can you tell us about that, the process of that interaction? 
The meeting presided by Secretary Wang Qishan didn't have many scholars. Altogether, there were about seven. The limited number guarantees everyone enough time to share his opinion. I was the first to speak and talked for quite some time. Whatever suggestion I had, I was fully free to speak. Apart from voicing our opinions, we can also report them in written form. We can even make revisions directly on the draft given to us. The forms can come in great varieties. The key is whether our opinions make sense or not. They would be taken into consideration by the drafting team. But of course, there are valuable ideas presented, and I believe some of them have already been adopted. Compare the political parties in foreign countries with the CPC in terms of their rulership of the country. Obviously, the CPC has, is the ruling party on a perpetual basis. In most Western countries, they shift political parties based on elections. But in both cases, uh, there is a process of ruling. So how does the CPC's ruling philosophy compare with that of, uh, of foreign countries? I think there are four important differences. First, the CPC is a long-term ruling party whose legitimacy is codified in our constitution. This differs greatly from the West's rounds of reshuffling with general elections. Second, the groups of people represented by the CPC may differ from those in the West. The CPC safeguards the ultimate interests of the general public and continues to improve its mechanisms and institutions to represent the fundamental interests of the vast majority of people. The third difference lies in the party's ruling principle. Because the CPC enjoys long-term rule in China, it's convenient for us to unify our long-term and short-term goals divided according to different development stages. This also explains the many five-year plans in China from the first five-year plan to the second, the third, and today, the 13th five-year plan. How can the CPC keep moving forward without coming to a halt in the middle or seeing governing goals break down into pieces like in certain other countries? The reason is that China is implementing the CPC governing goals based on different development stages. The fourth point is that if there's a major difference between the CPC and the Western ruling party, I believe that will be the power relied upon. In China, we govern by the people and for the people. And so the single most significant philosophy in our governance is the mass line that we take as the lifeline and guiding principle for the CPC. The administrative divisions of the Communist Party operate on several levels of authority. The highest are the National Party Congress, the CPC Central Committee, the Politburo and its Standing Committee, and the CPC Secretariat. Then there are lower CPC organizations, including party committees at the level of provinces or autonomous regions, municipalities, prefectures, counties, townships, and villages. Although national-level decisions made at the central level get much of the publicity, many decisions are made at the lower levels. What I'd like to do is understand the decision-making process of the party at the grassroots level, the party committees in uh, townships or small cities. The decision-making mechanism at the CPC's grassroots level cannot compete with the Central Committee in terms of how regulated they are. I think this has to do with the capability and quality of the local representatives. The fact that the CPC has not been strict enough in implementing rules and in enforcing them in relevant institutions also has a role to play. Some of the decision-making in the past upheld democracy with collecting opinions through various means beforehand, but others did not. Chances are that the grassroots party secretary may think he had clearly sorted out the problem by himself and had been quite right in his own understanding. So even though meetings are held for approving decisions, he would dominate and influence the outcome of the meeting. If opposing ideas are presented, he would be very upset and even seek revenge towards the dissenter. And in a one-party system, how can you uh, establish sufficient checks and balances uh, to prevent uh, abuses of power? 
We prioritize supervision both within and outside the party. Within, we have a comprehensive intra-party supervision system. Organizations like the Party Discipline Inspection Department are responsible for implementing disciplinary measures and guidelines, making suggestions, and supervising how party cadres and leaders are carrying out rules in practice. This is what we refer to as internal supervision. Besides, we also have external supervision, like legal supervision from the NPC, democratic supervision from the CPPCC, and other means. The CPC promotes political consultation for democratic supervision, where every party participates in the administration of state affairs. So whatever policies the CPC wants to issue, democratic parties will be consulted for suggestions. The eight major democratic parties in China, as well as the All-China Federation of Industry and Commerce, participate in decision-making for important measures. Their participation itself is an effective way of supervising officials. More so, supervision by the public is everywhere in today's society through the Internet, in the NPC, the CPPCC, and other venues. Corrupt officials have nowhere to hide because of pervasive public supervision. We are aware that past practices in the decision-making of the party committee at the grassroots level were wrong and not democratic enough. Now that we have spotted the problem, we want to finalize the decision-making process with fixed procedures at all levels of party committees. Not long ago, the Central Committee published for local party committees a working regulation that specifies procedures for them in convening meetings, making decisions through ballots and other methods with the required minimum number of attendees. It has also been emphasized that before making important decisions, the committees must hold discussions with relevant parties, consult experts, and ask for their analysis and verifications. Other specific requirements include letting the party secretary and other senior leaders be the last to speak in meetings. If not, other people might just pander to them and their ideas. So even if we may not completely remove their dominance in the meeting, we try to minimize their influence by making it a must for them to speak in the end. From my point of view, these procedures play significant roles in guaranteeing a democratic and scientific decision-making process. How do you know it's, it's happening? Because how do you monitor what's happening? Because sometimes a, a party leader is so strong, everybody will be afraid to even report what is being done. Well, before a party secretary makes the decision, he himself must perform in-depth research. In the process, he has to exchange opinions with the city mayor and others because the CPC upholds collective decision-making. In particular, decisions on major issues must be made through plenary meetings of the local party committee and other means. There are more than 50 members in a party committee at the municipal level. Before the party secretary calls for a plenary session, he would first investigate the issue of concern and ask the drafter to do likewise. Meetings to solicit opinions like those at the central level will be held during the drafting process. When the draft comes out, more rounds of revisions will be made. At the official meeting, everyone speaks up and presents his ideas on the basis of past achievement. Members usually vote by a show of hands to pass a document and vote by ballot to appoint candidates to important positions. In my view, even if the party secretary is very arbitrary and exercises a dictatorship, party members should still have the opportunity to freely express their opinions on important decisions and personnel appointment. I'm sure there are occasionally cases where subordinates would bring up contradictory ideas to the, the senior leader, the, say the party secretary in a municipality, uh, but what happens afterwards? Would people feel afraid that, they, that the leader would take revenge on them in some way or uh, hurt their careers? And how do you monitor that? It seems very difficult. Actually, it depends on the nature of the decision. 
if it has to do with approving decisions about reform or the legal system through the plenary session of the CPC Central Committee, there may be a little opposing voices. Everybody has the chance to express opinions beforehand. Of course, some opinions may be adopted and others not, as the Central Committee evaluates the situation. But during the appointment of certain individuals, such as the promotion of leaders, speaking up could be very sensitive. This may involve personal interests of certain individuals, as everyone craves for promotion. However, in the process of such decision-making, everyone still enjoys the opportunity to make comments. Let's take the uh, situation on a much lower level, say a, a small city where the individual is so powerful he kind of intimidates everyone and people are fearful of revenge on, on that level. Is that, is that a real problem? When it comes to decision-making by party committees or governments at the grassroots level, particularly on economic matters, there are certain limits. If it concerns only a small project, a meeting in the mayor's office may be enough to make a decision. I once served as a deputy mayor. For small projects in our city, chances are that the mayor and deputy mayors will just have some discussion while soliciting some opinions before a decision is made and implemented. However. If a project concerns a large amount of money, for example, if an investment is above 30 million RMB at the city level, the decision-making process will be much more complicated. Consultants will be invited over for official analysis and verification, for environmental evaluation and possibly for information disclosure and publication. A plenary meeting of the municipality may also be held for an official vote. To conclude, the party secretary may be quite influential when it comes to some issues and dominate decision-making on certain matters. There are also many regulating elements that can serve a role. Now that the CPC have introduced the accountability mechanism, we should be more confident about the democracy of our decision-making process. Despite its accomplishments over the past 95 years, the Communist Party acknowledged it has made mistakes, particularly the Great Leap Forward in 1958 and the Cultural Revolution. On May 17th, the People's Daily, the official newspaper of the CPC, published a commentary called China will never allow the repetition of Cultural Revolution. The article characterized the Cultural Revolution as a major setback during the development of China and its party. It said the revolution is an integral chaos bringing disasters to the party, the country and the people. The history has proved that the Cultural Revolution was totally wrong in its theory and practice. And the CPC has admitted, analyzed and corrected the mistakes made by itself and the leaders of the country, drawing lessons from both failures and successful experiences. The mechanisms that you've described for decision making at the central level, at the local level, are very scientific and, and democratic uh, and uh, very unique to China. Uh, as a historian, if you go back in time, uh, it hasn't always been that way. So what can you say about the development of this process to perhaps correct decisions that were made in earlier times that didn't use this process, that were more arbitrary, that turn, didn't turn out well? The decision-making mechanism has been evolving and become more democratic and scientific, especially since the era of reform and opening up. But the CPC only realized the problem after it paid the price. Before reform and opening up, under the leadership of Chairman Mao, incomprehensive decision-making wreaked havoc to our party. In 1958, Chairman Mao put a lot of premium on the steel industry. He even expected China to overtake Britain in a fairly short period. An important decision was made at that time to double our steel production from 1957 to 1958. Chairman Mao raised that idea. In this case, the heads of concerned industries should have a clear picture in their minds. The ministers of metallurgy, railways, coal and electricity all give positive responses when Chairman Mao asked them whether the targets were attainable. That made the decision final. 
But in the end, the decision proved to be wrong and disastrous. So in retrospect, how come such an irrational decision was made? That's because the chairman enjoyed supremacy and leaders unconditionally supported his ideas, regardless of practicality issues. From this case, we can clearly see the consequences of irrational decision-making. The lesson here is that the scientific value of a decision should be founded on democracy. Otherwise, the decision would be poorly grounded and disastrous. What are the, some of the ways that decision-making looking forward in the party can be improved? I think our party's decision-making mechanisms have been constantly evolving. Over the past year, decision-making according to the law has been emphasized a lot. We also aim to institutionalize the decision-making procedures. Another new phenomenon is that Secretary Xi Jinping takes opinion polls from the Internet very seriously. China today sees more and more netizens who are well-educated and young. Any decision made by the party and the government will be extensively discussed online and receive various comments. Some may show approval, others a lack of understanding, and some may even demonstrate strong opposition. Secretary Xi Jinping stresses that the leaders and party cadres at all levels should pay close attention to opinions online, asking them to browse the Internet once in a while to read people's feedback. I believe this would be of great assistance in making our decision-making process more democratic and scientific. The CPC, the party, is a work in process. It always will be, and that is its strength. For the world to understand China, it must understand why the CPC asserts that its continuing political leadership is optimum for China's development. One key is the party's adaptability, stressing experimentation and testing new policies. But the CPC, as the ruling party, has a higher obligation to enhance standards of living and personal well-being, which includes reform, rule of law, transparency in government, public participation in governance, increasing democracy, various freedoms, and human rights. President Xi states that the CPC should be governed by standardized rules and procedures that are open to public oversight. Only by adapting continuously, focusing on real-world issues, can the party construct a truly prosperous society. Understanding the CPC on its 95th anniversary takes us closer to China.